In this short video, I want to cover a couple of topics, which are again, classic engineering theory, specific heat capacity and latent heat. And I'm gonna start off by saying heat is energy. It is measured in joules. Don't confuse it with uh, temperature, which we measure in degrees C or degrees K, Kelvin, or if in the US, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. But for SI units, degrees Kelvin is the one. So let's just take a, an example here. If I had time going along the x-axis and heat going along the x-axis and add temperature going along the y-axis. What I'd expect to see if I had a block of ice is that as I added more heat energy, so we're gonna think of heat energy in this example by adding candles. So I'm gonna add a candle and as a result, the temperature of the ice will rise a little bit. And I'll add another candle, add more heat. The temperature of the ice will rise a little bit more. And you'd have thought that by adding more and more candles, then what would happen is that we get a steady proportional straight line. But actually what happens is this. We have more candles, we get an increase. We have more candles and then suddenly we have no increase. And it flatlines for a bit, add more candles then it increases. Add more candles, flat lines for a bit. Add more candles, then it increases. So what on earth is going on there? So we're adding heat, we're gaining a, an overall temperature rise, but there's certain points, let's label them here, um, A and B, where there is no temperature rise. We're putting more heat in, so what on earth is happening to that heat energy? What is it doing? Well, it turns out it's causing a phase change. Because at this stage, we've got ice, and this is um, solid water in effect, isn't it? And the temperature, this might be minus 50 degrees C, okay. Um, we add more heat, the temperature rises. Eventually, as it hits zero, all of the energy, all the heat energy that's going in there is causing a phase change to liquid. So it's actually breaking up some of those, um, those chemical bonds that's creating the solid, make it liquid so they can flow around each other. And here we've got a liquid phase. So a posh word for freezing is fusion. To bear that in mind. So here we have the solid phase. Here we have liquid phase. And what happens when we heat a liquid, think of a kettle, eventually it'll turn to steam, it'll vaporize. So the point where it turns to a gas, posh word for that, vaporization, we'll come back to it. So this stage is, it's a gas. So we've got three phases of liquid and there is plasma after that, which is superheated gas. Irrelevant for us at this stage, we'll leave that to the physicists. So we've got solid, liquid and gas. And we've got two areas, A and B, where seemingly the heat isn't doing anything, but actually it's causing this phase change. This heat here is known as latent heat. So if you chose the one kilogram of iron to keep you warm in the cave overnight, then you're wrong. Actually, it's a one kilogram of water, the one liter of water at 100 degrees C that will stay warm for much longer. And think about doing the washing up. You've got a, a sink full of hot water. You put the, um, put the cutlery in it. When you take the metal knives and forks out, they're red hot, put them on the side, which stays hotter for longer, or well, the water does. Okay, and that's for two reasons. One, there's a greater mass of the water for a start, but also it's got a high specific heat capacity. Now, specific heat capacity is essentially a measure of a, a, a material's ability to hold on to heat energy, and therefore a measure of how long it takes to heat up in the first place. So let's do a little bit of uh, maths and state the formula that we're gonna need. So, The formula that you need for these specific heat capacity questions is Q equals MC delta T. So let's look at what each one of these means. Q is the heat, and the heat is given in joules. M is the mass of the object. Given in kilograms. C is the specific heat capacity. Uh, 
I'm going to have to just remind myself of those units. I've got the pretty fruity. Let's ask Google. Specific heat capacity units. Here is information from Gordon England Thermal Spray Coating. Ah, joules per kilogram Kelvin, which makes sense when we arrange, rearrange this thing. If we did a unit analysis, then that would be, divide both sides by M delta T, Q over M delta T equals C. So that would be joules per kilogram Kelvin. Makes sense. So the, the units for this are joules per kilograms Kelvin. Kelvin being the measure of temperature. Delta T is measured. That's the temperature, not heat, temperature. Measured in Kelvin, though for most, um, most applications you can use the uh, the temperature in degrees C. The difference between degrees C and degrees Kelvin is 273. So zero degrees Celsius is the same as 273 degrees Kelvin. So let's just do um, a quick example. If it was 100 degrees C, that would be 373 degrees Kelvin. You pretty much won't ever get to zero degrees Kelvin, certainly not on Earth, perhaps in some far-flung area of the universe, you get to zero degrees Kelvin. Because zero degrees Kelvin is the absolute absence of energy, where the atoms aren't vibrating even in a tiny, tiny little bit. So there's absolutely still. So zero degrees Kelvin certainly isn't going to be achieved on Earth, certainly not outside some kind of weird astrophysics lab. Um, but for our purposes, degree C and degree Kelvin can be used interchangeably here. Okay, so we've got our formula now for specific heat capacity. We understand that specific heat is uh, a measure of how much energy that material can store and therefore how long it takes to heat up. Water takes quite a long time to boil, um, so it's got a high specific heat capacity. Steel, you heat it up with a blowtorch, it's red hot within a few seconds, it's lower specific heat capacity. Right, so we've got a situation here where we've got a cube of gold. Now this cube of gold weighs 192.4 grams. Um, and it's heated from a temperature of 30 degrees to some other unknown higher temperature. And in heating that, it took 226 joules to induce that temperature change. And the specific heat capacity of the gold is 0 0.03 joules per gram Celsius. Okay, now I've chosen this example because I stated that this was measured in joules, that's measured in kilograms, that's joules per kilogram Kelvin, and that's Kelvin. Now, something to look out for. Quite often in the engineering questions, I will encourage you to work in SI units, convert all the grams to kilograms, all the Celsiuses to Kelvins, and all the millimeters to meters. Usually do that. However, in cases like this, you can save yourself a lot of work. It's given us the mass of the gold in grams, and it's given us, helpfully, the specific heat capacity in joules per gram. Now, I've already said that even though the SI unit for temperature is Kelvin. For this application, we can use Celsius. It makes no difference because it's talking about a temperature change. So we can happily use the 30 degrees Celsius that we've got here. So let's plug in some of these numbers. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find out with the addition of 226 joules of heat, how hot did this thing get? So let's find that out. So instead of drawing it all over the place like this, I'm just gonna state all my variables and I encourage you to do the same. So let's state those variables. We know that the mass is 192.4 grams. We know that C is 0 0.03. And we're trying to find the change in temperature. That's what we don't know. And it looks like we're given Q, which is 226 joules. Something to look out for is whether it's megajoules or kilojoules. 
If it's kilo, times it by a thousand. If it's mega, times it by a million and so on. Just use your SI prefix conversions. Okay, so how hot did this thing actually get? Well, we've done what is good practice for an engineering theory question, stated the formula, stated the variables. Let's just substitute in those numbers. So Q is gonna be 226 is equal to the mass, 192.4, times C, 0.03, times delta T, that's the thing that we don't know. Okay. So what can I work out straight away? Well, 226 is 226, and 0 0.03 times 192.4 is 5.772 delta T. Now, unfortunately, because this is a multivariable um, equation, I can't give you one of the helpful little formula triangles, so you're just gonna have to learn how to rearrange your formula. We want delta T, so those two are times together, so I can divide through by 5.772. And I prefer to think of moving that under. 